And uh, the best numbers that I've seen on that is that the estimate is that for people who make more than a million dollars a year, they will ha end up paying about $47,000 a year in additional taxes over what they pay right now, just to put that into some context. There are a number of fees that are going to be imposed on the pharmaceutical industry, on the medical device industry, and on the private health insurance companies. You know, the private health insurance companies are going to have about 25, 24 million new customers. And so they're probably going to come out pretty okay in that. Um, so that's part of the thinking behind there'll be some extra small percentage fees on um, both device manufacturers, drug makers, and the health insurance companies. Um, there are some increased restrictions on health savings accounts and flexible spending accounts. So those things are going to be tightened up and your ability to use those dollars to pay for um, either non-medical things or over-the-counter drugs, things like that, are going to be a little bit limited. And then in 2018, the, there will be a tax that kicks in on group health care coverage that is in excess of a policy that costs $10,200 for an individual and $27,500 for a family. And that tax, that 40% tax, will be on any amount that that insurance policy costs over those thresholds. So if you're an individual and you have a $12,200 policy, your insurance company would be charged a 40% tax on that $2,000 difference. Now, of course, everybody believes that this will be passed right down to the consumer um, or the employer. So the idea then is that if people will um, actually try to choose a lower cost health insurance policy. It's not clear to me how this is all going to play out from a policy standpoint. There are a number of economists who believe that this is really a critical um, piece of, retain of controlling costs in this country. Um, I've been concerned all along that if people choose less robust health insurance policies and then they don't get the care, you know, they choose not to get the care that they need, that at the end of the day, I'm not sure we're really saving our country any money. But that's going to remain to be seen how that's going to all play out. So those are the main sources of funding. And again, I do want to point out that the Congressional Budget Office has been consistent that this is projected to lower the deficit by $140 billion or so in these first 10 years. I was interested in your discussion of the fact that you think the bill is structured in such a way to change some of the incentives to pay to keep people healthy rather than um, focus on sickness care. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask some questions that relate to things that might be inconsistent with that. Is, is there in the 80 to 85 percent requirement that your insurance money be spent on healthy or on health care, you said, mm -hmm. does that include health uh, prevention mm -hmm. activities and exercise, et cetera? Mm -hmm. uh, related to that, one of the big controversies around Medicare was to limit the Medicare, Medicare Advantage programs mm -hmm. that some insurers have offered, which have largely focused on lifestyle changes in a lot of ways, which most of us would think advantageous. Uh, how do you think that's going to be affected by the changes in the bill? And are there other things to change the system more radically? I mean, as this got debated, the, the insurance changes got focused on so the health care benefits mm -hmm. didn't. Okay, so the first part of the question was about um, how those health care dollars will be spent. And one of the things I don't think that I mentioned in the first part of the presentation was that uh, by, 20, by 2014, preventive services are going to be zero out of pocket for people. So things like colonoscopies, mammograms, those sorts of things, there will no longer be any co-pays, whether you're in Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance, to get those screening health services. Um, there's nothing specific in there about things like um, gym memberships and that sort of thing. But many private health insurance companies offer those benefits or give you a discount if you, if you do those things. And there's, I don't believe there's anything in this legislation that would prohibit that continued practice. Uh, in terms of Medicare Advantage, that is actually another funding source that I uh, neglected to mention. So Medicare Advantage plans are Medicare plans for our seniors that are administrated through private health insurance companies rather than the federal government, as most of Medicare is. And it has been estimated that the federal government pays 14% more 
per person for Medicare Advantage plans than they do for regular Medicare costs. So there's been a fair amount of focus on that because that's a lot of money when you take it times the number of people in Medicare Advantage plans. And those plans are going to slowly over time, over the next three to five years, get lower payments from the federal government. So that 14% is going to come down to a much lower percentage in four or five years from now. Now, what that's going to mean to Medicare Advantage plans, I don't know. No one really knows for sure. Some companies have said, oh, we're going to get out of the business. Um, but we don't really know if that's going to be true or not. The, some, what some Medicare Advantage plans do offer their um, enrollees are things like gym memberships and um, some offer some help with prescription drug costs and things like that. So I think as a society, we're going to have to decide whether or not that's how we need to be spending our money in terms of supporting those benefits over regular Medicare. Certainly none of the core benefits are going to change in those programs. And we'll have to see what the private health insurance companies do. You know, it's hard to know what their profit margins really are on those plans and whether or not these reductions in the government subsidy will make a difference in them or not. Now, your third question, I believe, was about is enough being done in this plan to really get practice changed? No, I don't think so. I think this is just the beginning. There um, are a couple of very encouraging things, though. One is that there is money to really start to spread out these accountable care organizations and, and test them in very robust ways around the country. If anyone's really interested in looking at what this might pan out, you have one place, obviously, here in town, Cleveland Clinic, that is sort of like an accountable care organization. Different kind of practice setting is the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania, which is a much more spread out system with... Um, links to primary care doctors in a number of the surrounding towns around Geisinger. And they all work as one system incredibly well. And they have um, just phenomenal outcome data about the health of their patients and what they've been able to do in that system. So if you want to read more about it, that's a good place to look. The other is the Intermountain Health System out west also has done this a pretty good job. So it's a beginning. Um, there is a, a commission that will be created to monitor this very closely and also to test other systems or other possible ways of paying doctors to help get us to being more of a health, uh, true health care system rather than a sick care system. The concern is that whatever, wherever we end up, everyone wants to make sure that it really works. You know, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services is going to have to be completely retooled at some point to take into account a new payment mechanism for any kind of provider, hospital, doctors, et cetera. And everybody wants to make sure that we actually adopt something that works and really does improve quality and decrease cost. So I think that's why yeah, you're not seeing a fi final solution in this legislation because I don't know that we know what that final solution is. But the the uh, efforts are there absolutely to figure out what that is, to figure out what is that, be that best way to make it. And it may be different in different parts of the country in different practice settings, urban versus rural, et cetera. There probably is not one solution, so we have to figure out what that best combination is. Yes, if I get sick in Akron, Ohio, where I live, I'm going to get, as far as I'm concerned, much better treatment than if I get sick in Memphis, Tennessee, okay? The reason being that I know the doctors, I know the nurses, it's my hometown. They don't know me down there. What can you do to get something set up so that all of my medical history, something like they do with the VA, mm -hmm. can be shipped down to this place uh, immediately, getting rid of the privacy things, etc. I'm not sure you want to totally get rid of the privacy things. I <laughs> think they're pretty important. But that is what this idea of health information technology is all about. 